The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Would you, if you have a little one in your presence, would you please lift them up if you are able? And if they are a little bit more than little, have them stand, please. Go ahead. Have them stand up or lift them up. Yeah. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, good. Baptisms are pretty fun. Baptisms matter. People matter. There's a resolution before the National Church in a couple weeks. I know because I wrote it. I wrote it because it's important, I think. Membership. Are you on a roster of a church or do you really belong? And what's it mean to belong? It used to mean, because a lot of people like that place. I've never been able to locate that on a map, but people talk about this place called Eusta. It used to be that we had hundreds of people and we did lots of baptisms. And Eusta didn't work out. But I intend to make sure that it does work out. And I hope you do too. I hope you find agreement around the very basic principle that high standards and high expectations make a difference. Discipline. Spoil the rod, spare the child. I'm not so sure how that goes over in this political climate, but I can tell you that spoiling doesn't help. I can tell you that information does, as long as it comes along with love, guidance. So what's it mean to be a member? In the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, this is what you have to do to be a member of a church. Commune one time annually and make a contribution of record of a penny. That's all it takes, and you are a member. It sounds like the organization that I don't want to belong to. It sounds like an organization that I'd have no interest. It sounds like if that's what the hierarchy say, I'm against it. So there's a resolution that will go before the national church that raises the bar and raises the standard. And I suspect it will cause some interesting conversation and dialogue. Today we baptize. How many of you pronounce her name M-I-A, Mia? And how many of you pronounce it Maya? How many of you don't know? Mother, father, shout it out. Mia. Mia. It starts by knowing how to say the name, right? What do you think Mia's favorite color is already? What do you think her favorite food is already? <laughs> There's a way to find out, right? <laughs> this could be fun. Father, tell me her favorite food. Then mother, you tell me what her favorite food really is. You see, it's all about relationships, and membership's always about relationships, and membership's about keeping our promises. So I want to lead you today in a discussion of this particular chapter of Luke, but I want to start it with this. I never want to put you in a position where you say something that you can't say honestly. As your pastor, I never want you to say something or do something that you can't see to be truth. So do not say the words when we do the baptism where you are supposed to respond unless you truly mean it. If it really says what it says, and I know it says that we are to place the word of God into the hands of this little one 
as she grows up. Do not answer members of St. John's Lutheran Church, guests of St. John's Lutheran Church, apostate individuals of St. John's Church. Don't do it. Because I don't want you in a position where you not only deceive yourself, I don't want you to lie publicly. I want you to be a truth teller. I want you to be a promise keeper. I want you to think about what it really means. If you say you're going to put the word of God in someone's hands, then you show me, you, you show me your stuff. Show me what you've got. Because I'd rather hear nothing than something if I know I can't count on it. Can I hear an amen? amen. That doesn't sound like a Lutheran church. Well, actually, that's probably louder than the most Lutheran church. Yeah. Now, if I were in a Baptist church, what might that sound like? Amen. Yeah, okay. So maybe I'm going to go Baptist Lutheran or something. But this 10th chapter of Luke is a pretty powerful chapter. It starts with, but I can't really help you unless I show you. See the big screen up here? See where that little electrical socket, socket block thing plate is? If there were a screen there sticking out, not interfering with the organ, it will never interfere with the organ. I already know the sound tests on it, so that, that hound won't hunt. Another one over here. If I could show you, I would show you the picture of Jesus leaving. How many of you are geography and history fans? I would show you the text today because I'd show you how Jesus is leaving and crossing the desert from Samaria. I would show you the points where he stopped to try and teach along the way. And I would show you, pointed out on a map, where the people said no to Jesus, rejected his teachings, and said, you're off your rocker, son of God, creator, redeemer, sanctifier, all wrapped up in one. You don't know what you're talking about. I'd show you how he got to the places where the religious leaders approached him and said, absolutely not. We're not going to go for what you have. We like our traditions. We like what Abraham taught. We like what the prophets taught of old. And we're sticking to our guns. We don't do what they say, but we're sticking to our guns. And even when Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish your traditions, I came to fulfill your traditions. I didn't come to destroy what the prophets and the law say, I came to fulfill it because I am. And isn't that another name for Jesus? Isn't it interesting that today we baptize Mia? And you take those three little letters... And I don't know, but maybe we're going to start something today. And maybe someone in that family is going to hear this crazy pastor from Boyertown said something. That if you take the three letters of our name, I am, happen to be in it. And what if when you look into the face of this child, you see I am? What if you see a child of God? What if you see the creation of a man and a woman that created a child for the sake of to be blessed for ministry and mission that this child doesn't even know yet? Or maybe the child does. Maybe when we're babies, we actually know more about God than when we get older. What if a baby already has it all? And all of a sudden they get exposed to the world and little by little, God knowledge gets chipped away because of earth knowledge. And that's why the church is somehow functioning around, can we keep the word of God central so that we can remind ourselves who we are? I am lives within me. The one who spared not his son, but sent his son to die for me is not good theology. But the one who sent his son to die and conquer death and raised from the dead, that's the one that I want to serve. So we got Jesus getting beaten up like crazy as he's walking through the desert and he's making his way because remember what happened? Maybe you don't. Let me put it in a timeline for you. We're six months away from the death of Jesus. It is autumn. And as Jesus is journeying, what might be falling off of the trees this time of the year? Do leaves, when they fall off the tree, remind you of anything? What's about to happen? No. When the leaves fall off, what's about to happen? Winter. And Jesus not only knew the season of winter was about to happen, but the season of winter in his own life. So he must have already been feeling the chill 
already expecting and anticipating the coldness. And he makes it two miles from his destination. Again, a destination of Jerusalem. He set his face to Jerusalem. How many of you know people that when they make up their mind, when they finally make up their mind, nothing can stop them? Everything can go on around them, and nothing can stop them. When they set their face and they are on their way, they are going to go to their goal. Come hell, come high water, they're moving. As a matter, Red Sea, let the waters be parted. The story of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan doesn't defeat him. Jesus set his sight on Jerusalem to go and save our lives by dying on a cross and conquering death and raising, being raised from the dead. But he falls short, two miles short. He's on the side of the Mount of Olives. And he comes to a house owned by Martha, the older sister, younger sister Mary. And he knocks on the door to this home. Now home is not a familiar word to Jesus. In the last three years, and all of you have been sitting in these pews, because if you've been sitting in these pews week after week for decades, you probably ought to know the answers to this, and if you don't, then we got some stuff to make up, right? We got some remedial work to do. How many homes did Jesus have during his three years? Two. Yeah, where did he sleep? In the hull of a boat, by a fire on a beach side, and maybe underneath an olive tree. How many of you don't have a home? Oh, you may have a house, but you don't have a home. How many people do you know are restless and they're not at peace? They don't have a home. How many people do you know want desperately to have a home in their bellies, in their minds, in their hearts? They don't have a home. Jesus didn't have a home. The Son of God didn't have a home. So it's a warm respite when Martha opens the door and says, Jesus, and yells for Mary, Mary, he's here. And he's received after days and weeks and months of journeying where he was rejected. His politics don't matter in this house. His opinions that are being restricted, rejected even by the religious leaders don't matter in this home. Martha gets some water. Martha heads to the kitchen. Martha knows that Jesus is talking serious stuff and Mary's right there washing his feet. Do you ever wash someone's feet? And I'm not talking about kids. Do you ever wash a grown-up's feet? Do you ever take their shoes off, their dirty shoes, and peel their socks off, and you see the dirt line above their sock, and then all of a sudden you're washing their feet? It's a crazy rule today in the church, isn't it? I can wash your feet legitimately. One of the most intimate acts ever. The nerve endings in your feet, the sensitivity, the sensuality, but i got to be careful of hugging you because I don't want to be sued or accused of sexual harassment. But I can wash your feet. Now, if I ever heard a silly rule, that's one of them. So what would it be like if the church learned how to practically wash each other's feet from Mary's example? And Mary's there right by Jesus. And remember... Every time you hear Mary in the scriptures, this particular Mary in scriptures, all three times she's noted in scripture, she is at the feet of Jesus. The text today in the 10th chapter of Luke, she's at the feet of Jesus. When her brother died, she's at the feet of Jesus. And the one that most people remember is when she takes the perfumed oil and pours it on his feet and then with her own hair massages his feet. Now, washing feet, I'm not too worried about that. Pouring oil on your feet, I'm not too worried about that. But if I had to use my hair to rub it in your feet, we'd be at a loss. And if you're looking at, you know, yeah, okay, the guys are already, here he goes, he's going to pick on me. Yeah, that's okay, Ron. I will never mention your name, Ron. <laughs> or Brian. Or Terry. So anyway, 
So here's Mary at his feet. And Martha, back in the kitchen. And Martha, you got to know her personality. Martha's the one that's first up in the morning. She's first to the market in the morning. She's the one that's going to barter the most in the market for the best of the vegetables. She'll never put anything but fresh fruit on the table. She will always make sure that the eggs have no shells in them, which is, I think, an admirable trait in anyone. She's the one that's going to make sure that she's first in the kitchen, last out of the kitchen. Martha is a busy beaver. And those are folks that we appreciate in the church. We appreciate busy beavers. We appreciate those that are attentive to detail. We appreciate that, and we should appreciate that. But there's a warning to the busyness, the tyranny of the urgency, written by Francis Fenelon. It's a really quick read, probably about 15 minutes. I think it's all of 15 pages. But the tyranny of the urgency... If we get caught up in paperwork and lose sight of the people work, we're wrong. We're Martha. If we get caught up in doing the jot and tittle, we're Martha. We're wrong. We're going down the wrong path. It's always, always going to be about this Martha and Mary story. It's always going to be at the heart of the matter. So can you see Martha in the kitchen having the argument with herself? You know, I'd like to be out there too listening to Jesus. I know it's an important discussion. He's talking about walking through Galilee. He's talking about the religious leaders that aren't receptive to his message. He's talking about the pain he's feeling, the rejection he's feeling. Yes, he's the son of God, but he has feelings. Does that sometimes evade you? That the son of God had feelings too? It's pretty easy, isn't it? I'm a parish pastor. I think sometimes people think that I don't have feelings. And I'm just a rookie in a town that most people 50 miles from here never even heard of. This is the son of God. Feelings. And I'm not talking about whatever that song was back in the 1970s. I'm talking about empathy, sensitivity. Martha had it. She's not criticized. But she has this story going in her head. Where is everybody else? How come I'm cleaning the floors? And how come I'm cooking all the food? And how come? And you know what? And what's wrong with Jesus that he doesn't say, Mary, get in there and help her. So she comes out. And you see the text right in front of you. Luke 10, it's right in your bulletin. Lord, don't you see what's going on? Tell her to help me. And I love this. Jesus goes right at it in the most plaintive tone. Martha. Martha. Just like Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Just like Saul. Saul, why do you persecute me? Just like Peter. Peter, the devil's at your shoes. Don't let your faith falter. When the name is mentioned twice in scripture, that's a wake-up call. That's a, whoa, (laughs) there's something trying to be communicated here. And it's about tenderness and warmth, love, encouragement. It's the good stuff. Martha, Martha. Mary's at the right place. Number one, she's sitting. And number two, she's sitting at my feet. The most important thing for any church, for any person, is to sit still before the feet of Jesus and listen to what Jesus has to say. There are thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of churches that proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, at least in their documents. And there will be millions of people over the next days, yesterday and today around the globe, that will worship. They'll go to church. But will there be people in pews that are absolutely committed to doing work? Yes but never letting the work get in the way of what matters. Listening to Jesus. 
I can imagine all the servants of God. I spoke with one yesterday. I was at Abby Grove's graduation party, and it was really fun. Abby, you know, one of our interns, got to celebrate her. We get rid of her in a couple weeks. She goes off to college. And, and I'm talking to some folks there, and it was a good conversation because they are believers. I said, I'm a pastor. I serve in a Lutheran church. I'm a Lutheran Christian. And they said, well, I'm a child of God. I said, well, I'm glad you're a child of God. And I knew where this story was going to go real fast. Real fast. I knew the conversation was going to turn to they are people of prayer. And I think it's great to be people of prayer. And I think it's great to persevere in prayer. And I think it's great to endure in prayer. But I am one that believes in evaluation. I am one that believes that experience isn't worth a hill of beans unless it's evaluated. And when experience is evaluated and it's positive and successful, then you're moving someplace. So if a church is growing, you should be able to measure it. If people are growing, you should be able to measure it. If the people who are guests today, if you can walk out of here and say you heard something that causes you to want to try to get closer to God, then I'm going to feel like God worked through me and a good thing happened and all the praise and all the glory goes to God. If you walk out of here and say, I have no idea what you're talking about, then I have to get back to my knees and i got to learn better how to communicate. Because if I want all the praise and all the glory to go to God, then i got to be the best communicator and the best open vehicle by which God can speak. Because you can go lots of places and your ears will be tickled and you're going to feel like you go out of there and you're gangbusters and you feel positive and yippee yippee and yahoo and Norman Vincent Peale. I like the guy. But I could have never sat in the pews of that congregation. Because I want to get things done for the sake of the kingdom. Because in so many ways, got to be careful how I say this generationally, but I'm a little bit of a Martha. Because I like to work. And I like to see people grow and deepen their faith. And I just don't think anybody can deepen their faith unless you learn. And I don't know about you, but I think you learn best when you fail. I think you learn best when you fail and you're surrounded by people who love you. And they help pick you up when you fail. And I think you learn best when you're with people who love you and help you sort out who you are and what you are and what matters. <clears throat> I'm going to have a conversation tomorrow morning. It'll be bright and early. And it'll be with an executive of a, a corporation that is taking care of my father. And I know how this conversation is going to go. I can predict it right now. He's young. He's got a good degree. He's working on another degree. And I'm going to say to him, in about another 10 years, you're going to call me and you're going to say, let's write that article. What article? Because I know tomorrow he's going to be confronted with an opportunity to recognize his failure, just like Martha was confronted with an opportunity to recognize his failure. I'm going to tell him what he did was wrong. But I'm going to tell him in love. And I'm going to tell him I'm going to stand by his side as he corrects his behavior for the sake of himself and his organization. But what he did was wrong. And if he learns, if he's got enough humility in him to learn, he's going to grow up to be a fine leader. It's predictable. If he doesn't, he's going to get blown out real fast. Those of us who are over 35... It's incumbent on us to be like Jesus in this story and to help people when they make mistakes and to be forgiving and loving and tender and gentle and to nudge them on the right path. Because if they get to 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 and they can't hear a word of correction, well, that's just a shame, isn't it? And that's why this church has purpose. And that's why it's a privilege to baptize Mia. Because the I am that lives in Mia is the I am that lives in us. And if we have I am in us, then we've got everything. For the sake of Jesus, the name that we praise and give all glory and honor. Amen.